Here, in the middle of Algeria, about 1,200 kilometers away from Algiers, I'm about to realize a lifelong dream, a walk in the Sahara Desert. But the desert isn't empty. Immense, yes, the biggest desert on the planet, but not empty, far from it, in fact. On the road to the Timimun Oasis, I had imagined I would be in the middle of nowhere. Instead, I find myself in the middle of some sort of ceremony. A procession is forming. I wonder why so many people are meeting in the middle of the desert. What is this encounter about? And why is this tomb freshly whitewashed? I'll get answers to my questions later, but I can already tell I'm in the midst of an important gathering. In the Berber cultural tradition, a traveler is always made welcome. The people in charge of the oasis invite me to spend the day with them. It's over a cup of tea, naturally, that they explain what I've just witnessed. Every oasis has a zawiya, a little house, just like this one, reserved for guests, where we can have a cup of tea, eat, and even sleep. This celebration, which takes place once a year, is a very special event for us. The celebration forms a circle around the desert, always ending in Timimun, during a period of time determined by the lunar calendar. The dates of our visit to each oasis are planned well ahead of time so that everyone can best prepare for the arrival of the guests. Each oasis in the region is represented by a flag and takes turns receiving a delegation from the neighboring oasis. The dance in which we face each other symbolizes our reunion and the friendship among our villages. We greet each other and honor the marabout's tomb with a group prayer. The marabouts were wise men that lived in the oasis. Then, we have a meal together. The host oasis provides food and shelter for the others. 
The next day, we visit another oasis and repeat the same ceremony. I didn't notice it right away because washing the dishes in water after a meal is so commonplace. But then I remembered I was in the middle of the desert. What a surprise then to see a pipe sticking out of the ground from which fresh clean water flowed. In the evening, we meet around a campfire to seal our friendship. On this occasion, we sing the traditional Ahalil, a song carried down through the ages. The nearly constant presence of water today intrigues me. And now I want to know how these little patches of green we call the oasis can exist in this sterile environment. In the meantime, I'm looking forward to joining my hosts for tonight's celebration and singing the Ahalil. The Ahalil is irrevocably linked to the region of Gurara. It was born with the first oasis. Back then, long, long ago, most people were illiterate. The wise men, or marabous, began singing and reciting poems about the Berber culture, transmitting it orally to the Bedouins. That's what the songs are about, tribal life, water in the desert, and most importantly, the Fagaras. They also talk about the Marabouts, religion, love, and all sorts of things. When the tribes got together, the Ahalil allowed them to communicate more easily. They could get different messages and points across indirectly in a very non-confrontational manner. The Ahalil is singing, but it's also a language. A language so precious it is protected by UNESCO. The almost hypnotic rhythm of the songs lasts late into the night, 
putting me at great peace on my first night in the Sahara. Here I am in Timimun, the capital of Gerara. This oasis has become a small town of about 23,000 people. It's the busiest of the region's hundreds of oases. The other oases are much less developed, and some do not yet have electricity. For the time being, I let myself drift along with the current of activity in this section of downtown. When I visit some place for the first time, I often start by a trip to the market. This market, although very far away from any sea, is strangely reminiscent of the Mediterranean. All these fruits and vegetables could make me forget that I'm in the desert. Here we are at the market in Timimun, where I am selling carrots, cabbage, onions, parsley. I only sell food that comes from my garden, that I raise with my own hands. I come here because there are a lot of people. I live in a small oasis 12 kilometers away, but there's no market there. There are only vegetable gardens. If I want to sell my vegetables, I have to come to the market in Timamoon. I go onward, deeper and deeper into my discovery of the city. As the little streets lead me further into the old town, also called Xar, the atmosphere grows increasingly quiet, hushed. Is it the streets, made of sand, that absorb sound? Is it the narrowness of the streets that lets me wander, unafraid of getting lost? Is it the red walls made of dried clay that bring warmth to the darkest corner? Or is it simply that the light bathes everything it touches in unspeakable magic? Now I understand why this town of Sudanese influence is called the Red Oasis. Later that afternoon on Timmy Moon's main road, I feel inspired and as though I have traveled back in time. I was told that during Timmy Moon's heyday, between 150,000 and 200,000 dromedaries passed through each year. The caravans came to rest in the numerous oases in the region.
The Gurara has always been an artery, a crossroads in the Sahara, a connecting point between Maghreb and Africa. It was the salt route, the gold route, and the slave route. Today still, the effervescence is palpable, especially the moment when the buses pick up their last passengers and take them out into the desert. After a 12-kilometer drive, I meet up with a gardener from the market who receives me in his oasis. I don't know how long my family has lived in this oasis. But I do know I was born here and that my grandfather was already living here. My pond fills up every day, allowing me to water my lettuce, carrots and onions. The water runs continuously in the gardens, day and night. You just have to make sure that sand doesn't block up the system. Gardeners have to maintain their canals to ensure this doesn't happen. <laughs> you know, if the water stopped running, life here would quickly become impossible and the entire oasis would have to move. I don't necessarily want my kids to have the same life I've had. Growing plants in the desert is hard work. For now, they're in school in Timimun. I don't know what they'll end up doing, but I do wish them a better life. Out of my ten kids, I'm not sure there's even one who's interested in taking over the garden. One would be enough, but it has to be their choice. If none of them are interested, I'll have to deal with that. If none of my kids wants to take over the garden, I can always give part of it to another gardener on the oasis. I hadn't imagined life would be so peaceful here. Gently regimented by a daily schedule and taking nature's lead. This has been a perfect day. And I'm savoring every minute of it. I want to know more about the children I met the day before, 
what they do outside the gardens. Every morning, a bus makes the rounds among the oases and takes the children to primary and secondary schools in Timimun. This is Aisha Um Al Muminin School in Timimun. The school was founded in 1949 during the French occupation. Initially a girls' school, it is now co ed. Children start learning French early, ninth grade to senior year. In the class we call technology, we teach the children how residents of the Gurara learn to tame the desert and create the systems for finding water. Digging wells, of course, but also improving an early and ingenuous irrigation system, the Fogara. I remember what the gardener told me, his fear of having to abandon his garden one day if his children didn't wish to take it over. Most children aspire to another life different from that of their parents. But like the gardener, I hope that some of them at least will want to stay on and take over the gardens, perpetuating the ancient culture. Several times a year, we organize field trips to the oasis gardens. We want to raise awareness in the children and show them that nature in the desert is fragile. We show them how to plant palm trees and explain the irrigation system. It is necessary that they understand it and are aware of its importance. You can see the alignment of the Fogara and the wells dug every five to ten meters. We're here in the desert, inside a fogara. This tunnel has been dug between two wells to bring the water from the desert to the oasis. We dug it with pickaxes. This stream is not a natural stream, but man-made. It connects the wells. 
Now that we have brought the water from the desert to the oasis, we have to dispatch it among the little gardens. I'm fascinated by these fogaras, but let's see if I've understood how they work. There is a water table under the sands of the Sahara. In order to create a fogara, we have to dig several wells down to the water table, then connect them to one another so that the water can flow among them. The gentle slant of these tunnels naturally carries the water down and results in an oasis. This is the palm grove of Timimun. And here is a little fogara called Chinrisa. Each fogara has its own name, its own leisure, and its own manager. This fogara comes from about three kilometers away. The fagara is cleaned every year, from top to bottom. This is the mouth of the fagara. We use a unit of measure called the temen to gauge the amount of water. The temen corresponds to approximately one half a liter per minute. For example, this fagara measures in at 50 temen, and this one about 20 temen. We measure with this measuring stick. The day we measure the temen, we call in a measuring specialist. I'm not a measuring specialist, just a simple assistant manager. On the day we measure the water, we bring in this measuring stick, and the measuring specialist sets it up, like this. This stick indicates how many temen there are in the fogara. If there's been any increase or decrease. The gardener is not allowed to touch the holes of the tool. If the water were to stop flowing from the fogaras, we would have to dig wells and to bring up the water, like we did before, for centuries, in the olden days, before the fogaras. At the moment, I'm taking care of the ledger of the three fagaras in Timimun. It is kept in a house in town. And it's rarely taken out of the house. It's a precious document. Our ancestors left this system to us, and it still works. I was designated to be in charge of the ledger. It used to be with another family. But the kids in the family didn't want to take the responsibility. Let me show you. One man bought water from another. He brought me this paper with signatures. He bought it in 2001. He gave me this paper so that I could enter the information in the ledger. Now I'm going to write this down too so that I can give him back his paper. When I have about 10 or so, I'll write them in the ledger. God alone knows the future of the Fogaras. We hope they continue to work 
because of the basis of our food supply here. With the palm trees and the crops that are grown beneath them, otherwise there will be no more crops. In the Quran, there are specific prayers for rain. There hasn't been as much water in the gardens over the past years. I remember a time when we could hear the water singing in the Forgaras, in the heights of Timimun. Today, the price of vegetables has gone up due to a lack of water. You know, to survive here, there is only one solution. Solidarity. People have to help one another to maintain the Fogara system, our treasure, and to bring water back to the gardens. If everyone only thinks for himself, there's no future. The Fogara culture is passed on from one generation to the next and no one can date its origin. Perhaps 10 centuries ago, perhaps more. But one thing is sure, the vulnerability of this mode of irrigation is on everyone's mind. The delicate murmur of these prayers stays with me long after I've left this mosque. The Bedouin's day begins early, with a prayer. Then we milk the camels and lead the herd out into the fields. Then, around three or four o'clock in the afternoon, we have a bite before going back out to round up the animals. There is water in the desert, in wells, running anywhere from 25 to 30 meters deep, depending on the region. People like us dig the wells, mostly so the animals can drink. Other wells are dug by the state to encourage nomadic life. There are different kinds of wells. Some are manual or activated with help from the camels. Others work with solar or wind power. But in any case, you have to dig deep to get to the water. <laughs> in some regions, the wells are close to one another. But sometimes we have to walk for two or three days with the animals before coming across a well. Bismillah. <laughs> 
The conviviality of this evening almost takes my mind off the quickly dropping temperature. And yet, these nomads sleep outside. Nomads and gardeners have a very different approach to water. Nomads journey from well to well, sometimes over days, to find drink for their dromedaries. Gardeners who require water daily rely on the fogaras to fill their ponds. The pond is central to irrigating the gardens. Each gardener has at least one pond. The amount of water in the pond determines the cultivable area. The bigger the pond, the bigger the parcel of land. As long as there's enough water to keep it filled. One day, about 15 years ago, all of a sudden the water just stopped flowing throughout the oasis. Everyone was concerned, and everyone worked to find out where the Fagara had collapsed. We repaired the tunnel, and the water went back to running normally, the way it is today, although the water pressure is not as strong as it had been. Now that people want running water in their homes, we've had to dig new wells that tap into the water table that feed the Fagaras. As a result, the water pressure has diminished in the gardens. The division of water in the oasis works well because it's based on mutual trust. If someone feels there's a problem, for example, if I thought my water pressure had changed for no reason, I can ask for the commission for its advice and eventually the commissioners would redistribute the quantity of water among the gardens. Measuring the water divided among the different parcels of land is a big responsibility. Only a few of us are allowed to do it. A gardener can clean out the ducks, but isn't allowed to touch the different combs of the fogaras. My uncle, who is a member of the commission, has been teaching me about the ways to share and divide up the water since I was a little boy. We like to teach our children about the water division system for Fogaras. It's a tradition for us here. But knowing exactly how to do it and taking responsibility for the division is another thing. Now, at the age of 50, the gardener has reached the required age to join the commission. He'll take over from his uncle the task of dividing the water on the oasis. An oasis relies on finding harmony among different things. That created with nature is as vital as the necessary harmony among the inhabitants. People involved in the water division and measuring process cannot be any younger, 50 or 60. The commissioners are trustworthy people that the village inhabitants respect and can count on. 
It's a very big responsibility, not only in our lifetime, but especially before God, who judges our actions. The gardener and his uncle have been meeting more and more frequently of late. My work is to divide the water among the different parcels of land on the oasis, based on the Fagara ledgers. I know two days without water is enough to annihilate a whole crop, and I understand this transfer of responsibility. One doesn't acquire such a privilege lightly. Rather, responsibility is granted after a lifetime of patience, learning, and listening to the elders. <laughs> Thus begins a new commitment that will require his total dedication. In the desert, land alone is useless. Only water is valuable. Land only has value if there is water. Listening to nature, man has created life where it was least expected. Without genius or miracles, the oasis was born through hard work. I feel a mix of humility and harmony as I watch this gardener dam the water from parcel to parcel. I could even forget that the Sahara is just a few meters away. The world is a beautiful place if we just make the effort to really look at it with a caring eye. I want to hold on to these images of Algeria, the proud faces, the light, the sounds, and the silence of the desert. The world won't wait, and I'm excited to go meet it. Mm -hmm.